Testing, testing. All right, thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> what you're looking at is the uh, King Island dancers. And uh, th they'll go through uh, several, most of the songs are fairly short. Of course, this is a raven dance. As you can see, is a lot of display of uh, the resources. A lot of this stuff I currently use. <laughs> so when I talk about seals and, and marine mammals and reindeer and caribou hunting and stuff, uh, the products come from not only from the food they and nutrition they provide, but they're very spiritual, spiritual in nature, and that uh, we believe that. But um, some of the things I currently use are my seal gloves that I brought. Uh, there's some seal hides here that are dyed and ready for other productions. Um, this is uh, a seal hide. As you can see, it's kind of tattered. Uh, you'll see in a photo, my wife with seal skin mitts. She used this to make mitts. So just an idea. I know you're going to get introduced to me in a few minutes, but last time I did this and uh, in, this morning, I didn't get a chance to talk about a lot of things that um, that I get to uh, the when I was going through the photos. By by the time the hour came out, uh, there wasn't a lot of time. But you'll see me. Uh, this is a seal skin cap that I use. I used about two weeks ago. Um, Went about 200 miles on a snowmobile. This is one of these that I used. I bring an extra one, because sometimes when you're out hunting and stuff, your head starts to sweat. You don't want moisture anywhere, so you just you know wear these things uh, like this. Yep, of course I have a baklava and um, snowmobile goggles. I don't know if you ever heard of kivu, but you'll see muskox in, this, in my photos. The kiwi warmth is warmer than wool, but uh, this is the product of, uh, of kiwi. Uh, we use squirrel. This is a squirrel hide. I could talk to you about that. This is a wolverine, wolverine hide, wolf. And you'll see on my parka, when, I don't know if you'll get a chance to see it, but this particular part of the wolf uh, fits like this on the park because it has a design on it. Uh, there's a fox here, a uh, beaver. Uh, this here is uh, my wife's mukluks. <laughs> this is a reindeer hide. You'll get to see them. Uh, this is Ugruk right here. L let me know when, uh, when the students are here and we could, we could begin. Yeah, no problem. So anyway, this is this is from Ugruk, and you'll see the, the catches we, we have. This is the hide part of it. This is the sole of the seal. Of course, there's design and stuff that go with it. Again, these are my, uh, these are my wife's uh, boots that she uses. There's the insole inside. Again, it's Ugruk seal hide, and then uh, beaver hide around the edge. This is uh, Gwich'in Athabascan interior Alaska design. Uh, this is moose hide. Again, <laughs> you can see it's worn. And then of course her slippers, I brought her slippers, so hope her feet don't get cold at home. Um, we have vest. This is a, a parka my, um, my sister-in-law made. I'll put it on. It's a dress parka, and uh, it's fairly warm. But you'll see in my see me in my hunting clothes. It'll be totally different. Uh, this is this is muskrat. This is mus wolf wolf muskrat. Of course, this is handmade, as you could tell. Real pretty. Um, in the world of muskrat hide. It's the least expensive, but you can see the beauty of uh, someone's ability to see things and make things that um, 
maybe aren't the most expensive as far as uh, high goes. But the ability to understand how to, how to do things and make things really applicable. Um, I use this all the time when I travel. Of course, I'm here in New Syracuse, and I'm glad to come here. And let me know when you're ready, uh, and then we can do the official part. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you about some of the products that I brought with me and wanted to make sure that, that um, not only am I a hunter and a fisher, um, uh, born and raised in the village, as you'll see, is this beautiful village that I'm born and raised in. I'm not saying it to, to you're going to see with your own eyes uh, what, what it looks like where I'm from. And let me know when you're ready to begin. Oh, <laughs> I got people verifying what I say. <laughs> it's my family. I have a huge family. I'm the youngest of, I'm the youngest of 10 kids, really. Uh, there's five of us left. Um, but yeah, you, you'll, see, you'll see quite a bit of uh, features here. And I just wanted to, uh, I'll wait till she's ready and then we can get started. So whenever you're ready, Erica. This is my grandniece, by the way. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. <laughs> I'm getting videoed. I got uh, getting people from from uh, different parts. We've got my family in Florida listening. My my sister. Uh, but so happy to be here. By the way, glad to see all of you. I really appreciate you coming. Go ahead. All right. Arigato. Let me see. Hello everyone, welcome. I'm so thrilled to see a full room and see so many faces, familiar and new. Just want to thank you for being here and sharing your time with us. I also want to make sure we say hi to our Zoom uh, listeners. We have a lot of friends and family like Uncle Roy said from all over the continent. So uh, thank you all for joining us as well. Uh, my name is Erica Wood. I am a Sloan Indigenous Scholar here at the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. Um, and I am a master's student in environmental biology. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to my Uncle Roy, uh, Roy Ashley Felter. Uncle Roy is, I'm going to pull up this slide, I realize it's going to be lost at some point. Chair of the Bering Straits Native Corporation and President of the White Mountain Native Corporation, a member of the Inuit Circle Polar Council, and also the Alaska Federation of Natives. So he's a highly respected elder, and it's really an honor that he's sharing his time with us uh, today. He's also uh, a hunter and fisher, as you will see, a storyteller, an educator of Jimmy Likeways, uh, and uh, an advocate for subsistence rights. <laughs> and so before we begin, I just want to say a big thank you to the center for making this happen, and as well a huge Klayana Park to Uncle Roy. Uh, it's a really uplifting, joyful experience to have you here, and hoping to leave traditional knowledge and an academic experience is really special. So Klayana, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you. Again, uh, my name is Roy Ashenfelter. Born and raised in White Mountain, um, what I'm going to share with you is what, what I call the four seasons, um, winter, winter, spring, summer, and fall. You know, one of, the, one of our beliefs is that when we're out uh, hunting, that the animals and birds give themselves to us. And you'll see some of the, I'll try to explain some of the traditions behind that. And it's very important. Um, and you uh, hopefully I'll have time to explain to you just that when we're out there, we see abundance of resources. So we're not hunting everything we see. We're not shooting everything we see. We're taking in the environment and just uh, you know uh, trying to trying to find the lifestyle that's important that I hope to share with you. I am the chair of the Bering Straits Native Corporation. It's nearly a billion dollar corporation. And I'm also the president of my village corporation. I've been, been in that role. I've been chair for less than a year. I've been president of my village corporation for over 20 years. Um, the, the Inuit Circumpolar Conference is, a, is, a, is an organization that cons consists of Greenland, Inuit, 
Canadian Inuit and Alaskan Inuit and Chukotkan from Russia, the indigenous peoples of the North. We formed that organization to deal with the, with the efforts by uh, the other nations to go into the Arctic and do industry, to, to do whatever. Well, that's our homeland. That's where we fish and hunt and hunt marine mammals. We want to have a say in what's going on, so that's the reason that's been formed. We met in Greenland last year in Iliasit. Kind of interesting. Um, their claim to fame is one of their icebergs sunk the Titanic. So <laughs> I went there. It took me, I have a cell phone like everyone else, and it took me three panoramic uh, views to take a picture of an iceberg. We went out and we went out and did a fjord visit of the iceberg. We, only, we went for an hour and a half, we only went one third around an iceberg, just to give you an idea, the immensity of the giant sizes of these, uh, these uh, icebergs that go out. Okay, so um, just wanted to share a little bit about myself. Um, and um, I'll also answer any questions. I'm also, I have a career in, um, at COER, which is a nonprofit corporation. One of my roles there is, is dealing with fish and game issues throughout the state of Alaska, both federal and state. So if you have questions about fish management, game management, uh, I have a career in doing that. It's highly political in Alaska, by the way, uh, the take an opportunity versus subsistence versus uh, game hunting versus commercial take of fisheries. It's, it's a huge industry and we have, a, we have a lot of uphill battles in certain situations. Um, whenever you're ready. Okay, here we, we are going. Okay, so hang on, where's my point? Right here. So we're here, right? We're going to end up up there. Go ahead. And if you don't mind, I'm going to keep turning back and forth. This is Alaska in relation to United States. So and that's always important. This is the part of the world I come from right here, called Inupiaq, okay? And then right here is where I'm from, and you'll see the next photo. This is Seward Peninsula, and we're literally next to Russia. So right here is Little Diomede and Big Diomede. Little Diomede is owned by United States. Big Diomede is owned by uh, little, uh, Russia. The international date line goes between those two islands. So right now it's Tuesday, right? Every day they're looking at uh, Wednesday. So you could shoot something today, butcher it tomorrow, and eat it yesterday in a matter of minutes. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is White Mountain where I'm from, where most of the photos will be taken. And then this is the other part with the heart, and you'll understand why there's a heart by the time I get done with you. And then this is where I currently live with my wife and family. Um, go ahead, next one. Okay, this is the camp with the heart. This is Pilgrim, Pilgrim Bridge. Uh, go to the next one. This is the cabinet camp. This is the solar panel, believe it or not, with snow on it. This is in the middle of winter, as you can tell. This is a sauna. Go ahead, next one. This is uh, White Mountain, where I was born and raised. And you're going to see some very, very beautiful photos of my village. And I'm not kidding. Next one. This is White Mountain. This is, what, this is the house that I was uh, born and raised in. Uh, go to the next one. Uh, yep, go to the next one. And then the last one. This is the White Mountain. The reason they call it White Mountain is called White, that's the hill, White Mountain Hill. What, right in front is uh, Fish River. The name of the river is Fish River. Next one. So this is spring. Uh, this is Sledge Island off the coast, uh, right in front of Nome, 22 miles uh, west of Nome. Spring, spring hunting, you'll see uh, the different products that, uh, that come from the opportunity that we, when we go out, and by the way, I'm getting ready mentally to go out hunting in another, in another month. So go ahead. This is, uh, this is the boat setup I have. It's on the boat set, and there's a snow machine in front right here, but this is us getting ready. Go ahead. This is me, and we're tying the boat down. We're getting ready to leave, but, but uh, go ahead, next one. This is Ugruk, bearded seal. And uh, this is uh, myself, my nephew, and my other nephew. 
Um, and as you can see, many of the products we produce from this, and th these are what, uh, 200, 300 pounds. Um, and then you'll see us, uh, see me taking care of them. Go ahead. We're, uh, we're skinning it out, called off trucking. This is the flipper, this is the skin, uh, this is the blubber. We're, by the way, we just about 90% of this thing, so it's not a waste. If you notice, the head is gone. One of the things, one of our traditions on, on the head uh, is we believe um, after you take the head off, you give, you give water from its mouth and you put it back in the ocean. You talk to it, you talk to him and you tell him everything's okay. That this, he, this brother or sister gave his life to us and that, we're, he's, uh, that the animals that are down there need to know that everything is okay, that everything is gonna be good. That where they're at is safe too, by the way. So, next one. This is me braiding and testing, and you'll see uh, why that why that is in a few minutes. Uh, go ahead. Getting closer to the end, and and uh, this is. Could you run the video? What it is is right in the middle, right there is, is uh, the blubber from the ugruk, and we wrapped uh, we wrapped the intestines around the around the around the blubber, we boil it. Um, it's been cleaned out. And what we do is we, we, after we boil it, we chunk it. We eat it right there, the meal. We also freeze the pieces and, and, um, and vacuum seal them. And when we're out hunting again, that's another meal. Next one. OK, this is the, continuing on in spring, believe it or not. This is later on. This is my wife. She caught a trout right there. Um, and as you can see, it's the length of her hip. Um, go to the next one. This is us getting ready to cut them up. This is at Pilgrim Camp. Remember the one with the heart? Yeah, this is at Pilgrim Camp. Go ahead. This is me. Of course, I'm smiling away. Go ahead. This is us eating, getting ready to eat the fish. Go ahead. Next one. This is uh, the same trout. This is my nephew with a red salmon. Uh, go ahead. This is us pike fishing. And I know you have pike down here because I saw them. Uh, uh, so this is my nephew. We call him Luke. My, I call him my son. He comes from a single mom. She brings him up to, she, they live in Anchorage and they come up every summer and spend summer with us. So uh, I call him my son. And this is a guy from Hawaii, Jay Kaseki. He, he really likes coming from uh, Hawaii and visiting with us. Right, next one. This is the length of the pike. And next one, this is me cutting it up with an ulu. And this is the result. And this is the fried piece. And then we're having dinner. Next one. Summer. OK, here we go. This is fish camp on the Fish River. This is, this is literally where I was born and raised, eight miles up from White Mountain. But on, the, on my birth paper, it says White Mountain. I was born July 26th. When I was a kid, up until oh, uh, quite a few years later, what we would do is we'd go up to camp in June and not, not leave camp till August. There was just no means to, to travel uh, on a free basis like we can now. So next one. OK, could just roll? You'll see us, we call this seining. This is the Buck family, which is right down the river from us. Um, there's no noise? That's fine. No, no, no. it'll be enough without the noise. Watch this activity. This is done. Um, uh, this is pretty, we call her pretty driving her boat. That's her sister hanging on to the other end. This is their kids, and as you can see, they're walking in the water even though right now it's frozen. You can't go in the water right now, but now in the middle, of, there's me, there's uh, Aida. These are, this is the family that's down and around the river, that, around the bend of the river that, um, that's uh, fishing. And you could see in a few minutes here as we pull it in, um, the effort there. This lady that, uh, this is Harita. She's the matriarch of this family right here, um, and keep pulling it in. One of the things that you'll, you'll, you'll understand or learn is that this is a summer activity 
and you can see it's quite resourceful in how we do it. Um, we have methods to, to make sure that someone, uh, you could see me pulling, holding the lead line down, someone back there holding the cork line up. And the, there's a lot of noise, by the way, you just can't hear it. People are real happy. Uh, people are talking to each other, just pretty, pretty giving instructions. Um, and as you can see, the dark water here, that's salmon. And as, uh, as we pull it in, keep pulling it in. Sometimes you get four or 500 in a net and it's not that easy to pull in. This is about 200 by the end of the, by the, end of the pull in. Um, what they do, the salmon do, um, when they're traveling, believe it or not, they travel at night even though it's broad daylight in the middle of the summer. They stop in the morning, they school up in the morning and we have a, it's clear water. We could see where they're at. So we, we see them bunched up and then we go around the out, upside of them, come down and corral them in. As you can see, the, the fish are splashing. Um, the ones they'll be throwing out back into the water are white fish and grayling, the freshwater fish. There's one right there, I think, oh, that's a pink. Um, Silver? But um, I see a lot of Tom. what will happen is all the salmon in this net will be taken. All the salmon. This is a chum. You'll see a king in a few minutes here. Um, it'll really stand out. But this is what we do every summer. Um, and you can see the boat coming around to put the fish in. And I didn't get a didn't get a chance to show you, but there's a we cut them up with ulus and knives and stuff. So um, it's a family affair, um, and you could see all our you could see the kids running around hanging out. It, it, we want our kids to be there because there comes a time when you get old that uh, you got to pass on what you learn. So you just grab the fish and throw them in. And at, at the What's end of the day, what you do is you just uh, take a bucket and you wash out your boat. That's the fish line in there. Um, there's the king right there. They gave us the king, and that's a real gift. We got two uh, in this particular set. And I'm um, really grateful to them for that. That's a, that's a huge gift to us. And, and the people you'll see holding the, the king, maybe, is another guy from Hawaii. We have two daughters. Uh, they could, they're both older now. Both are married. But when they're growing up, uh, they realize they could bring friends to camp. They didn't want to be alone. So to this day, they still bring their friends. So, yep. And there's Nick, he's holding the king. It doesn't matter if he gets slimy or not, they're just so happy. So whenever you're ready for the next one, Erica. Okay, this is a practice run, by the way. This is, uh, this is Erica's grandpa. This is Erica's grandma, my sister. He's from Virginia. This is uh, Randall. This is me. This is Mary. Uh, there's, so I was, what we did is we did a practice set because they had uh, quite a few of the crew hadn't seen yet. So I wanted to make sure that we get it right when we find a bunch of them that we don't mess up because it, get, it gets pretty exciting when things don't go right. But anyway, go ahead. And this is my wife. Um, as you could see, I think in this particular set, I think we had 400 in it. And you could see the pressure on the net um, that um, that's happening. Go ahead, next one. This is the boat uh, with the fish in it, next one. This is the boat with the, where I'm driving and we just throw the fish in the boat. And this is, the, this is my, my son-in-law, Pat, with the king that on a different set, so go ahead. Now, this is the work, right? We go out and we say all this thing in. Well, for the next uh, five hours minimum, you're cutting and hanging. Uh, this is, we're making dry fish. 
So go ahead. Um, go back up one. What you'll see is, is a fish pen right there. And you'll see a, a shopping cart. <laughs> and it has fish in it. What we do is we take the head and gut, gut the fish. And then uh, the cutters, all they do is fillet. Uh, go ahead, next one. This is the result of our work, making dry fish. Go ahead, next one. This is Jake Kaseki, same photo, go ahead. This is boating down the river, shallow water, you could see real clear. Um, uh, just, just to give you an idea of some of the beauty, and I didn't add the beautiful photos that you get, I get to see all the time and take for granted that I would love to have shown you if I was paying attention to how to do this for you. So go ahead, next one. This is my wife and this is my daughter. This is at a different plane. Remember that? Remember the one with the heart? That's down the river and the target fish is red. Uh, but these are pink that we managed to, uh, we, were, we were collecting on the side. Go ahead, next one. So this is the pilgrim camp. The pilgrim camp, and I'll explain all this string in a minute. And then we have smoked fish hanging and we have fish hanging. The reason for the spring is uh, the string is the, is the signal, help us signal that a bear has come. And so, yeah, so that's the reason. It has bells on it at the house. <laughs> so anyway, go ahead, next one. So this is the same photo from the front. Go ahead. Uh, maybe you can run it. See, see salmon running up the river? Yeah, th this, they're running into Fox River what we call Fox River, and they're running in the shallow. Uh, they're very vulnerable, of course, and uh, in the evening, the bears come out, and they, they're able to catch, catch the salmon migrating. Next one. So fall. Here we go. This is a different season. And you'll see uh, every season has its uh, really significant activity. Um, Fall time is a big one. All the seasons are big. The hardest one to do is, is fall winter, and I'll tell you in a minute, so go ahead. This is a caribou herd, 350,000. Um, this is an insect relief area, and I'm not able to explain to you why that is and how significant that is. Our goal, no matter how long, we want industry to stay out of this. We don't know why the caribou go here in abundance. We just call it an insect relief area. The Brooks Range is miles, one, one end of Alaska to the other. They try to tell us they can go over there. Nuh-uh. Caribou go, go where they want to go, and they go this, this area every year. There's lots of industry happening in Alaska. We want to make sure this is maintained. We don't know why they hang out there. We just call it insect relief area. The Bala just call it insect relief area. And it's, it's an invaluable place for whatever reason that looks the same as the rest of the tundra, but they hang out here. So next one. This is us on a hunt. Uh, and you could see there's, it's five a day, by the way. Take is five a day. So this is, uh, this is seven, I believe, that we got that day. Next one. Th you know, this is, we're really happy. This is my, myself, my wife, and my, my friend. Uh, go ahead. This is me on a discovery hunt. I got word that the Windy Pass had, a, had some caribou. We hadn't been out there. So we went out there uh, just to check it out. And we got there, and we found, we found uh, four or five of them. This is one that I got. Next one. This is a moose. <laughs> so, Fall time, right? There's different activities. This is a friend of mine. We've been hunting together. He's from California. He married a, a lady from St. Lawrence Island. We've been, we've been friends together for over 40 years, and um, we raised our families together. This is my nephew. He's the one that got this moose. Next one. And as you can see, we're cutting and bagging it up. Uh, next one. We take the heart and liver, by the way. This is my son-in-law on a different hunt with his success. Go ahead, next one. 
this is this, my son-in-law, this is me on a, on a different, with a spiked one, and we're right in front of the water, so all we have to do is put the, put the moose in the water. Um, on this particular hunt, uh, there was four, four families, my nephew and I, my, my friend Tom and my other nephew, Scotty. We split the moose in half, even though I got this moose myself. You, it's, it's our tradition to share everything you have with whomever you have, whose member is with you. And it doesn't matter who got it. The idea is that this is food on the family for us. It's invaluable. I just had moose meat uh, yesterday. I cooked the moose meat. I brought the muskox roast moose, five, five uh, red salmon fillets, salmon berry, blueberries, which you'll see in a minute. Um, but yeah, we, we share everything uh, with who members hunting with us, and then we also share with other families, you know, single moms, grandmas, grandpas that aren't able to go out and go hunt. They really uh, cherish the opportunity to have these uh, invaluable food sources. You can't get the taste any place else in the world, but from these animals. So we're used to that. We wanted to share that with, with all our people. There's as many people as we can. Next one. This is us uh, hauling, hauling the catch into the boats. Go ahead. This is a different hunt. You'll see my, my nephew Scotty, my wife, Shailene, me, my grandson only uh, six months old. He's on a hunt too. And my daughter, go ahead, next one. This is truly a family affair. You, you try to make it so that uh, as you get older and stuff, that things that you do, that hopefully they'll show for me when I'm unable to do this. But anyway, so it, it'll happen. Um, so just go ahead, continue. This is the grandson. This is everything in the boat. This is my golden retriever dog that has lots of specialties, by the way. Uh, I'm teaching about hunt. This is another, uh, another resource. This is salmon berries. And you'll see in a bucket in, in a few minutes. But the, uh, the goal here is to pick as many as you can. In a week, they'll be gone. They'll be overripe. So you just. Uh, you just get out and do what you can to get as many as you can. And we have ideas where they're, where they're in abundance. We have names for the places we go to. They're kind of cool. Um, the next one, this is the same uh, uh, effort to fill these buckets, by the way, with salmon berries. Next one. And then this is the salmon. This is, uh, we call this Mary Lou's Patch. We have a name for these places. Uh, this is the boats and stuff, and we're picking salmon berries. So go ahead, next one. This is the result of one of the smaller buckets that's used to put in a bigger bucket. And as you can see, this is the result in the boat. And you can see a sm smidgering of blueberries. Go ahead. OK, on this particular, uh, the number of the family, about three photos back, uh, whatever, you'll see. Uh, Erica, my sister, which is Erica's grandma, we went down the river after we got done picking berries. I knew uh, from past experience that if you go farther down the river, there, there's going to be seals. I wanted to take my sister on a seal hunt and get, uh, she had never been on one before. This hunt was for her. She got everything out of this. So did Erica, um, um, but that that was my way of sharing with my uh, another way of sharing with my family. Um, go ahead, next one. This is us cutting them up. Um, my brother-in-law from Virginia, he loves spending time in in Alaska. This is me. This is Erica. Go ahead. Again, we're we're just we're just uh, we're. Cutting them up, and you'll see in a minute here what happens. One, we have a, a meal, and then there's, there's other outcomes from this. Go ahead. And then this is uh, what we call chunking. This is blubber, the seal blubber. Uh, we take it, and we chunk it up, and we put it in a bucket. To make seal oil, it's fairly easy. You just put it in a bucket. You make sure you put it in a, uh, in a, not in the sun. You kind of keep it in a cool area. 
you stir it every day until the, until the oil comes out of the blubber and you have seal oil. Voila. So it's real simple to do. But chunking it helps, uh, helps render it faster. So go ahead. This is uh, the result of the seal that they, we got. And this is called drying it, drying meat, just like jerky. Uh, so that's, that's a, it's, you know, maybe not the same as beef jerky that you all eat. But anyway, this is our way of getting dry meat. So go ahead. This is uh, in front of Nome. There's a rock quarry. By the way, we have only deep water port in Western Alaska, which is kind of cool. Uh, Inside the port was these belugas swimming around. There's no hunters. It's too dangerous. Right next to the city of Nome. You know, you don't want to be shooting and, and, and injuring people on, on any hunt, no matter what. This is common sense, right? So I'm just there at the port uh, looking at these beluga feeding inside, feeding inside the port. This is fall time. This is their, 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 uh, their fishing or, or catching um, uh, tomcod in a captured area. Next one. This is us at the Cape of Nome, 13 miles west of, west of, east of Nome here. This is Beluga. Uh, we, we try to get maybe three or four a fall, and then we stop. This is right off the point here, uh, the net is. For the next two months, there'll be Beluga. But we don't, you know, we're trying to put food on the table. This is a spiritual thing. Um, and so when we're done feeding our families, we're done. The resource is still there, but you can go out and go visit them and you can believe it or not, in our way we can talk to them and let them know things are good. The reason they hang out here is when, the, we, when we were doing this, I didn't take a photo, but a beluga came up and right next to shore, right next to us, uh, Swam right next to us. We didn't, you know, we didn't bother. It's it's right there. Uh, but the reason for that is because they push the uh, fish up the next to the rocks, and they're able to capture them. Go ahead, next one. This is another activity in the fall time called tomcod fishing through the ice. This is all fall activity, by the way. Um, this is my wife. Uh, there's no limit. <laughs> kind of cool. Uh, codfish. And it's another, all these things are fresh, right? Have ways of cooking them, eating them, preserving them. The way we do it is we, uh, after we have a meal, uh, a codfish meal. By the way, if you, if, if you go to McDonald's and you have filet fish, codfish, that's what it is. So this is our codfish right off the, right through the ice. Uh, but uh, what we do uh, with the extras, we bundle them up. We freeze dry them, and uh, within uh, within a month they'll be ready to eat. All you do is pound them and eat them. Uh, that's another way to take care of them. Um, next one. This is my daughter. Same place, same area. Just having a blast. Uh, go ahead. Oh, my, her mom. Back up. Her mom made this parka for her. Yeah. Next one. And there's your famous hunter right there. <laughs> Yeah, and there's people on the bridge. Uh, there, there's, there's water over here. And they're, they're fishing with uh, rod and reel to catch them. But anyway, right here. Go ahead, next one. So this is winter activity. Uh, I, I just went on a snowmobile ride. I put about 200 miles on my, on my rig. Uh, I went to White Mountain and back by, by snowmobile. I went hunting uh, for caribou uh, two weeks ago. It had been minus 20 in Nome, in the, in the state of Alaska, for a long time. And uh, we were get, believe it or not, you get tired of cold. Um, so anyway, we're out there. It, it's been minus 20 for a while. And it gets really, it gets really uh, rigid when it has a little bit of wind with it. It really, it really reminds you it's cold. We got it to 10 degrees. We decided to go out. I got a frostbite right here. My, my cheek was really white. My nose was tinned from, we got out there, it was still minus 20 in the hills. We could see these shawls of wind uh, moving through. In those areas, it must have been minus 40. We only hunted uh, uh, maybe uh, 30 minutes. We could see tracks, but the danger 
of being in that condition was much greater than the opportunity. So we just, you know, we turned around and went back, you know. My nephew went back up to the same area uh, six days later and they got six caribou. So, um, yes, here we go. So this is crabbing. We do this every year. Go ahead. This is uh, what we do. All you do is uh, you go out to shore fast ice, you make a hole in the ice, you put a pot down, you make sure you have a peanut butter jar that's cleaned out, you put bait in it, we have fish hanging in there. Uh, there's no real special technique except get out to the ice and put it in. So anyway, go ahead, next one. This is the crab we get, this is another photo. Next one, you can see they're alive. Uh, the next one, this is uh, my nephew and I. He keeps me really, he's a super hunter and fisher. He calls me all the time and keeps me really busy doing this stuff. Even though, I'm, even though I might be busy wanting, wanting to watch news. So anyway, I don't know why I want to watch news. But anyway, here you go. There's me again with the photo that you guys all got to see. I'm putting the bait back in, uh, or I'm taking it out. Yeah, I'm taking it out. Uh, you have to change the bait once a week. Uh, crab don't like uh, tainty bait. You have to put fresh bait in there. I learned that the hard way, by the way. So some things you gotta, be, some people tell you the right thing, and you, oh yeah, you're right. But anyway, what happens is this. If you put down tainted bait, you go check your pot, you're not gonna get nothing. You go check it again, you're not gonna get nothing. The guy comes along and says, Roy, change your bait. Okay, so I changed my bait. Guess what? Go check it again, I got crab. Now go ahead, next one. This is, uh, this is a permit hunt that, uh, that's done annually in Nome. It's called a tier two hunt. What it is, it's a, it's a limited amount of uh, muskox to be taken, and it's called tier two. The reason it's called tier two is because 50 people could put their permit in and only 10 to be drawn. So that's, that's so we were lucky to, to do this. So next one. This is my friend again on a different hunt. He's got it tied up so he could turn it over and we could start butchering it. And as you can see, it, <laughs> it's a little bit cold out. <laughs> kind of little, it's getting toward dark, maybe uh, five or six in the afternoon. Go to the next one. This is us when we're done. Next one. There's, oh, by the way, back up one. You can see me. We're all, this is different, right? I'm, I'm in my parka, got my cap on, my wife's in her parka, sealskin mitts. We've got, you can't see my snow pants, we're in bunny boots, we're all dressed up. And I'm having a snack, go ahead, next one. And this is our snowmobile rigs, by the way, uh, and our sleds and stuff uh, that we go out hunting with. These are gauntlets on there, high wind shields and stuff. I, I, by the way, I, I use the GPS put a GPS right out in front of my rig. That has saved my butt many times, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I, I've been in conditions where you can't even see 20 feet, but the only way you're getting to where you're going is by, by looking at that GPS. I've really come to rely on it for many things. We're out in the ocean hunting. When it gets foggy, you can't see where you're going. Hello, having a, having a GPS has really changed my life. I use it all the time. How many of you know what an inReach is? We snowmobiled from Anchorage to Nome last year. My daughter in Honolulu, whenever we travel, uh, I connect her to my inReach. Anywhere, anyone that's on your cell phone, you can, you can connect. We had 20 people watching us travel across Alaska. My daughter would text us, what are you doing? Because we'd be stopped for a while, and we're not supposed to be stopped, according to her. So she's seeing what's going on, seeing when we broke down, seeing if we're stuck in the water, you know, all that kind of stuff. But the inReach system is, is, is a really good way to connect to people and make sure you're connected and be safe, by the way. It's important to do that all the time. Be considerate of what's going on and making sure that people know where you're at might not be the most liked person in the world, but it's still important that you're safe. Next one. Okay, this is a different hunt that I went on. I had a permit for, go ahead. 
this is uh, my wife's take. Her and I hunt together all the time. She's my partner. She does everything. All the things you see, uh, she, she, she got this muskox and that was her permit. The muskox are right over there, by the way, just, just beyond us. They hang out on top of the mountains in the winter. They don't go very far. Um, and then we're, we're only allowed to shoot a bull. This is called a boss. On these tier two hunts, uh, you have to do what's called a trophy destruction. You have to get a hacksaw and cut the horns off. This, the intent here is a subsistence hunt, not a trophy hunt. So they, the, the game management requires that you do what's called a trophy destruction. So that's the intent behind that. Next one. And that's us butchering these, uh, these animals up. As you can see, they got short legs like me. They look really big and morally, but after you get, break them down, uh, they're, uh, they're, they're, you know, they weigh maybe two, 300 pounds. Next one. And then I don't, yeah, this is a video of what my wife took. And there's me butchering right there. Um, there's our sled that we use. This is a mountaintop called Golden Gate. We have names for all our places, by the way. <laughs> so when we're out hunting, we could tell uh, each other where to go. Uh, yeah. This is totally different than the summer. This is mountaintops, green. Uh, yep, next one. This is me continuing to butcher. Um, as you can see, uh, standing over it, resting. Go ahead, next one. This is us after we got done at camp. We decided to go to camp and take a little rest, have coffee. This is the sled with the meat in it. This is the sled with our gas, with our stuff, with our knives and stuff. But this is the rigs we use, the snowmobile rig, uh, snowmobiles we use. Go ahead, next one. This is what was I saw maybe uh, three weeks ago. It was only maybe 15 feet away. I had uh, tr trouble trying to uh, capture it with my cell phone because it would, it would move around. It would stand only for a few seconds. This is a weasel. Um, if you got one of these uh, at camp or anywhere, if you have a mice problem, within a week or two, there'll be no more mice, period. They're very voracious in taking care of mice. If you got a mice problem, these things, we never touch them. And for that reason, and mice will come back. By the way, they will come back. We we had we had a mice problem last last spring, and we're hoping that uh, one of these guys will come back and do his work. The next one. So, voila! <laughs> I really appreciate being here. By the way, this is my first time in Syracuse. Um, I, I've traveled several places to Europe, Greenland. Uh, uh, Hawaii, Mexico. Not so much on the East Coast. I've gone to Florida, gone to DC, gone to United Nations. But as I go out to these rural areas and see what, what else is out here, it's a lot of fun. It's a great experience for me. So I enjoy being here and I enjoy presenting to you what I have. So if you have any questions, I'm willing to try to answer them. <laughs> Yes? So, you know, was there anything that drove you in particular to, you know, get these positions of, you know, president or chairman? You know, any reason why you wound up there? Very good question. Um, I grew up in a family of 10. My mom and dad, uh, my mom spoke mainly Inuit, Eskimo. I think she went to third grade, and my dad went to, I think, eighth grade. Raising 10 kids, right? <laughs> so. As I, as I uh, realize um, for myself that I can get an, I got an education, we're required to write to eighth grade. And then, uh, by the way, when you're in eighth grade, all the kids, all the kids, myself, you didn't go to junior high and high school in your village because there wasn't a junior high and high school in your village. We all had to be shipped to different places in Alaska to 
to get an education. I continued on it because I felt like I could do, I could, I, I could pick things up. And I went to secondary education, went to college at UAS. One of my goals, long, believe it or not, a long time ago was to, was to, was to come back and, and help uh, the people that I born and raised this love that I think I could provide the service that I learned to gain that we have disputes about for our subsistence rights. That's just the way it is. I go to a lot of game meetings. I go to a lot of fishery meetings. On the corporate side, I'm the chair. It took me a long time to become chair, by the way. I'm getting real old. But one of the things you do do as chair, because you're in, you're in that role position, uh, you, you, get to, you get to have uh, a leadership. That's, in my, in my opinion, special. Um, we have companies all over the United States. We're nearly a billion dollar company. And I personally believe I have a lot to give. To, and by working as a corporate member for my regional corporation and my village corporation, I really believe that I can, I can give back to our people in that way. So thank you for that question. Yes? Um, I was wondering if you could talk about um, your experiences with um, hunting and fishing over your lifetime. How has your, how has your and your community's access to those different, like those different food resources and animals like changed? Um, and and also, how have those, like, how have those populations changed? Like, have you seen, like, yeah. are there, you know, when you were a kid, were there, were you able to freely access like muskox, and that's no longer the case? Okay. So muskox was introduced after I was born and raised. Moose was migrated into the Seward Peninsula because there's huge fires in the interior. Uh, climate change is real. It is real. I'll give you an example. You know, out in the ocean, uh, Bering Sea, to, to try to get to your question, the Bering Sea temp has, has risen by eight to nine degrees. That's the current study. When the ocean is normal, we have cold winters. I live in the Arctic. That should happen. We should have cold winters. The world should experience that, that where we live at in the Arctic should have Arctic conditions. You'll see photos, and if you haven't seen them already, the, the climate change that has effect on the, on the, on the on the North Pole. We now have vessels going through the Northwest Passage. We had 12 of them this summer, in last summer in Nome. What has happened is the temperature in the Bering Sea uh, gone up. The salinity level has changed. And that's really significant. The, when the ice freezes, it creates a less salinity in, in, the, in the ocean. And um, if there's less ice, there's greater salinity. The pollock resource that I talked about is migrating into the Bering Sea. Guess who comes with them? The commercial industry. So whatever we can do to, to get back to normal, I encourage it, because I see it. Um, the, the caribou population is going down. Uh, yeah, the, the dramatic weather effects. We had uh, typhoon Murbach last fall, and it, it, it really woke us up as to what, what can happen in our world. We have late, late freeze-ups, early spring breaks. It's, it's real. Climate change is real. Um, we still do our thing. We still do what we want to do. Wait, very good question. I appreciate that very much. Yes, and then you. I was, I was in Costa this summer, and I saw a sign everywhere about hunting practices um, that you could get fined for meetings that were not properly 
like the heart of the animal. Is that something that because of the commercial folks? Is that something that the that you guys have had like like you need to start doing it properly if they're not on the land? I was curious, I've never seen that before that there was an issue of people leaving behind you and not breaking down. Excellent question. I don't know if my, my niece can get me back to Alaska, but um, Remember when I said the uh, caribou migrate uh, to Seward, they're on the Seward Peninsula right now and then they migrate back up north to Brooks Range in the spring and then the fall time they migrate back down? Well, guess who's in the middle? Nana, Kotzebue. Yeah. They are the, they are the, um, they are the, uh, their, their, their lifestyle is really dependent on caribou. And one of the, one of the things that is uh, required is not what's called wanton waste. Uh, some of these hunters are going out um, and shooting animals and not taking care of them right away. They're like on a three or four day hunt and they're successful on the first day. And by the third day, even a 40 degree temperature, your meat is going to start to spoil. So there's, you know, so there's this effort to try to get them to Fine if you want to do this, but the intent is for food, then you need to do it right. So that's the reason behind that. Yeah. I have a question, then you. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. This is awesome. <laughs> um, I'm curious, you talked about the salmon berries. What other plants do you rely on for subsistence or for medicine? Yeah. Very good. Uh, there's quite a few others. Uh, one is, uh, there's uh, surah, which is uh, willows. And they're really tiny. Uh, you have to pick them when they're budding. And we call it surah. The other one is takayuk, which is off the beach, green. Um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, there's like four or five others that, that we, we get. For as far as medicinal, Stinkweed, believe it or not, and you guys got them here too. Um, we use that as a medicinal um, source. Um, you have to do it right, of course, because you might not like to taste one. Two, you don't know what you're doing with it if you haven't done it before. So, yeah, be very careful in in doing in, in setting up some of these opportunities that we we do. But I would recommend, uh, you know, watch us before you try it. Oh, I got a story for you. So a long time ago, a uh, long time ago, uh, people from the other world decided to come up and figure out why the Alaska natives up in the Arctic uh, can live up there. You know, they're drawing blood from us, you know, and doing, you know, doing all this kind of important studies that they're going to figure out that they can do for themselves to live in the Arctic. And um, so one day we were having a meeting, and uh, uh, we asked them, uh, what are you doing? And they said, we're doing these studies to determine uh, why it is you can handle the Arctic. And we looked at them and said, wear warmer clothes. <laughs> 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 That's the only thing you got to do to live in the Arctic. <laughs> so any other questions? Yes. You were, oh, I got you. <laughs> you were talking about the um, kind of lottery style hunt for yeah. the muskox. Does that apply to any other animals up in Alaska? No. Okay. There, if you go on the website for Alaska, there's what's called a tier two hunt. And there's a several other species that, like buffalo, I think, and a few others that have the same process. But moose is not, caribou is not. Bear isn't, uh, no. So that was the, that's the only one in our region. And you had a question? Yes, um, Ron here from Fiji, based in North Carolina. Um, loved all the stories and pictures, and would like to know, uh, you shared earlier about water from mouth of seals severed head that was poured back into the sea. Could you elaborate a bit more on the meaning and significance of this process, spiritual or other? Yeah, so the meaning is this. All these animals that I've had a chance to hunt and fish, we believe they have a spirit. And you respect them. 
this is passed down, by the way. This isn't me just making this up. This is, this is, and by the way, I don't expect you to believe me. This is what I do, okay? And if you have a different point of view, that's okay. But this is what I do for my life to preserve, one, the opportunity, and actually believe that you can converse with the animals and birds and stuff. So to the question about spirituality and those kinds of connections, um, in my personal world, the one thing I, I like to listen to is the, is the loon. They have all kinds of sounds. And when you watch them fly, they fly really direct because their bodies are big and their wings are small. So they don't waste any time going, going from A to B. But for whatever reason, you'll hear them uh, talk to you. I use that in the late summer, early fall, when I'm getting ready to go out and go hunt. I ask them, you know, what are you doing? How are things going? Where, where can I go? Please let me know when I, when I think about hunting that I have an opportunity to be successful. Just normal talk. But this is an actual process that you learn to develop after a while and believe, at least I do. It's, again, it's, I'm not saying you have to do it. This is what I do. This is what I was taught. It's a wonderful feeling. Um, it's, when you get out in the country, uh, you're not, you know, like seal hunting that I, you, the ugrik we got. We're seeing other ones all day. We're not shooting every one we see. We're looking for uh, the ugrik. There's ring seal, spotted seal on the same ice. We're passing them up because we don't want that one that day. I ask the crew, uh, what do you want? And if they want a ringed or a spotted seal, we go after that one, and we get him that one or her that one. There's other ones all throughout the day. They're in abundance. So when we're out there, there's lots of things that you're experiencing with these uh, opportunities that are just life-giving. Um, on our moose, we're not successful all the time. Nome has a huge moose hunting population, huge. And um, last year, we didn't get one. That's just part of life. But you stick it out there, and you make an opportunity. You, you know, you do all the things you think you can do right to, to have success. Um, but very good question. I have, I have these beliefs. Those will never go away from me. Um, I still do them every day. I, I enjoy being here, by the way, and I, I really sense the, the calmness and quietness and happiness that you guys all get to see me talk about that uh, you have to see visually. This is a lifestyle that currently is going on, too, that's important for you to know. Yep. Any other questions? Yes? Um, I saw the, the like, shrimp and the bears, but do you have any other kind of like protocols or practices where you're all Good question. Um, <laughs> maybe, because you'll, <laughs> you'll laugh at me. We're down the river fishing on the Fish River, uh, on the Pilgrim River, and, and uh, I get out of the boat. My wife gets out of the boat. We're trout fishing, and I happen to be furthest one over, and I'm fishing away, and I'm a real hunter. So anyway, I'm fishing away, and I look over, and there's a bear sneaking on me. <laughs> 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 yeah, so even though I sound like I'm, uh, it's kind of like one of those mistakes you do, um, and it turned out to be a fortunate one because the bear ran and we ran. Um, <laughs> but uh, in seriousness, uh, on our moose hunts, believe it or not, we run into bear all the time. Um, we don't. I don't shoot them. I'm not a bear hunter. We find one in a river swimming. We could boat right up to it. You could shoot it right there if you wanted to. But um, the, the thing that you want to do is be noisy. Most of the bears, since we have a prolific bear, bear hunting group in Nome, Alaska, are scared of humans. Most. It's the ones that are emaciated, that are hungry, that you really uh, 
you really need to, to those ones are hungry. I got a polar bear story for you too. Um, I got I got a polar bear maybe 35 years ago, uh, but one of the things that that happens uh, when you're out and you have an opportunity, whether you're doing anything or not, you make sure your conditions are good. If it's bad weather, getting windy, and the ocean starting to uh, to um, look dangerous. Stop. Go to safety. You might have saw a polar bear, but stop. You don't endanger yourself because this is, you know, this is. So um, one of the things that I learned from other ones that have, other people that have been around them, they aren't scared of humans. They aren't. So when you're running away from polar bear, grab a glove and throw it off. They'll go check out your glove, and maybe you have a chance to get to get to where you want to go. Um, but yeah, it, it's a it's the the light the living life in the Arctic. You learn these different uh, nuances uh, that uh, come about that um, you know from personal experience and talking to other hunters. By the way, I talk to hunters all the time. They share with you what's going on. Uh, we talk to each other all the time. We talk about crabbing. We talk about where we're going to go, how we're going to do things, what did we do, what areas we we went to, what it looked like when we got out there. So, and then I share that with them too. So it's a communal, communal effort to have success for all of us, and you do that by sharing. Yeah. Anything else? Anyway. Again, it's my pleasure to be here. I really enjoyed uh, this opportunity to, to be in Syracuse. So, yeah.